Wonderful. So my name is Kate Warburton and I'm a forensic psychiatrist and I've been the statewide medical director for our state hospital system for over a dozen years now. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I um, developed a real interest and enjoyment working with people who have uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders when I was in uh, medical school and uh, as such went to a public psychiatry conference to learn about how to work with this population. And when I was at that conference, this is over 20 years ago now, I sat through a presentation where we were um, educated about the increasing criminal uh, justice involvement that people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders were experiencing. And the speaker at that conference advised those of us who were still in training that if we wanted to work with uh, people uh, living with schizophrenia that we should do a forensic fellowship because uh, increasingly people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders are being uh, incarcerated and locked up. And, and I did. That's it motivated me to do a forensic fellowship. And um, unfortunately, the problem's gotten uh, considerably worse uh, in the two decades that I've been uh, uh, practicing and, and as, as medical director for our state hospital system, I am every day in touch with the realities of, of really terrible outcomes for people who suffer um, with some of these disorders. So I th that's what I'm doing here. I feel very strongly about trying to improve access to care for people um, who suffer from from this particular condition, and I'm volunteering my time to share what I what I know about it uh, in order to uh, try to help make this model effective. So uh, a little bit about me. So today we're going to talk about the CARE Act, and hopefully after a very brief presentation, um, I will impart a little bit of understanding about our new model for mental health treatment in California. So in this talk, I'm going to review the fundamentals of the CARE Act, including eligibility criteria. I'm going to have a case example or two. I'm going to talk about the care petition process and also talk about where to find more information. So the CARE Act, or the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Act, is intended to be a new process that can be supported and served by existing programs. It's intended to provide behavioral health services to severely ill, vulnerable in, in individuals while preserving self-determination to the greatest extent possible, while supporting that person to gain purpose and a sense of belonging. Care is intended to be an upstream diversion to prevent more restrictive conservatorships or incarceration. Care is designed to hold the behavioral health system accountable to holistically serve those who have the most complex care needs. Care is intended to help people stabilize so that they can begin healing and exit homelessness. At the foundation of the CARE Act is the CARE Plan or the CARE Agreement. And we tend to think of the CARE Plan or the CARE Agreement of being composed of three distinct areas, which we refer to as the three-legged stool. The first leg of the three-legged stool includes wraparound behavioral health services, the most intensive 24-7 uh, wraparound behavioral health services. The second leg of the three-legged stool includes housing. And the third leg of the three-legged stool includes stabilization medication. It's important to note that accountability in care goes both ways. In addition to being a pathway to engage the individual through a care plan, care supports accountability on the county or other local government part partners. As a party to the care agreement or plan, the court ensures the county can provide a robust and responsive set of services and supports to a population with the most complex care needs. This is the problem that care is trying to target, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. While people living with schizophrenia make up only 1% of the overall population, studies have shown that they make up 20 to 30% of the homeless population, 15% of the state prison population, 
and 24% of the jail population. And our experience in state hospitals is that people cycle through each one of these settings, uh, as well as our state hospitals. These are the care eligibility criteria. An individual has to be 18 years of old, 18 years or older, with a diagnosis of a schizophrenia spectrum or other psychotic disorders. The person has symptoms that are severe in degree and persistent in duration, which may cause behavioral functioning, which interferes substantially with the primary activities of daily living, basic activities related to patient care, and which may result in an inability to remain stable uh, and independent to maintain stable adjustment and independent functioning without treatment, support, and rehabilitation for a long or indefinite period of time. That's a lot of words. Um, the person is not stabilized with ongoing voluntary outpatient treatment. Either the person is unlikely to survive safely independently in the community, such as maintaining personal safety, hygiene, diet, health, and or necessary relationships without supervision, and the condition is deteriorating or services and support are needed to prevent relapse or deterioration. Participation in the CARE Act is the least restrictive alternative, and the person will likely benefit from participating in a care plan or a care agreement. Hopefully, all these words will make more sense uh, by the end of my talk um, and how this uh, eligibility criteria is crafted to catch a certain subset of our population and give them priority access to care. I'm going to talk a little bit about schizophrenia uh, spectrum symptoms and how they are uh, related to um, uh, the types of outcomes that I mentioned a few slides ago. Schizophrenia often has a prodrome, which are symptoms of a functional deterioration that precedes psychotic symptoms. Uh, the development of schizophrenia tends to follow kind of a classic pattern. Uh, and if you're working in the emergency departments, I'm sure you've encountered uh, parents bringing in a, a, a child who uh, was doing very well, well adjusted, uh, developing normally, and then had a period of time where they uh, started uh, dropping out of classes, dropping out of social activities, disengaging from their friends, disengaging from their extracurricular activities. Uh, and starting to behave in ways uh, that are um, uh, at odds with the with the person they have been. This is called the prodrome. It's very uh, typical and classic uh, in schizophrenia. That precedes the development of what we call frank psychotic symptoms. Um, the two most important psychotic symptoms uh, for our purposes are what we call positive symptoms. Those are hallucinations and delusions. And basically with schizophrenia, uh, the brain has problems in terms of the way it perceives stimuli. So uh, we all participate in a consensual reality where, where we all uh, have an input and, and perceive it the same way uh, with our, with our um, uh, functioning uh, uh, filter system in our brains. What happens with schizophrenia is stimuli, uh, the filter system uh, is not working correctly. So people can hear or see things that aren't there. In, in my population, the people who end up with criminal justice involvement, it's oftentimes uh, auditory hallucinations where they're hearing voices that aren't there. And many times um, those voices are telling people to do things. Uh, so when you see someone on a street corner and they're screaming, uh, it's a very uh, distressing thing to witness, but those individuals are not screaming at us. They're screaming at voices in their heads. Oftentimes, the hallucinations will order someone to do something at uh, for fear of penalty that's that's worse than than the um, uh, command. So a lot of times we see people who are getting into criminal justice uh, situations because the voices are telling them to do things. Um, at risk of being uh, punished if they don't do them. Uh, so that's a very important symptom cluster to, to be looking out for. And then delusions are where an individual misperceives reality through false beliefs. And oftentimes in this population, it's paranoia. Uh, people will have persecutory delusions 
Uh, they will believe that the mafia is out to get them or the FBI is out to get them. And so as, uh, as a clinician or as someone approaching them attempting to help, uh, sometimes the individual will not understand uh, who we are or what our role is or our intentions are, and will get um, incorporated into uh, uh, symptoms of paranoia. And that often leads to people refusing help. Um, it also leads to things like uh, being unsheltered. You hear a lot of parents talk about their child becoming increasingly fearful of them uh, due to paranoid delusions and, and the child or young adult will start sleeping outside or sleeping away from the home um, because they develop a paranoia about their, their family of origin. So these are the two positive symptoms of psychosis, uh, hallucinations and delusions. And these are the symptoms uh, that really uh, tend to uh, uh, lead to bad outcomes and uh, really targeted uh, with uh, care court. Other symptoms um, uh, include disorganization in speech and uh, behavior, uh, what are called negative symptoms where an individual just has diminished emotional ex expression and abolition. The two types of schizophrenia spectrum disorders that, that we see uh, in the criminal justice uh, system and that I anticipate will be seen in, in care court are schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. And the difference between those two things is that schizoaffective disorder has a mood component, but it has all the same, what we call psychotic symptoms I just talked about. Unfortunately, another aspect of schizophrenia spectrum disorders that makes them very difficult to treat is that the majority of patients who have them are not aware that they are ill. I mentioned um, uh, individuals can uh, have delusions and they truly believe that those delusions are real. So that if you say the mafia is not out to get you, I'm a clinician, I'm here to help, uh, the individual will not believe that because their delusion is strongly held and they and they don't understand that they have an illness. Uh, instead, they, they truly believe that they're in peril. There's a fancy word for that. It's called anosognosia. Uh, but really what it is, is a lack of insight of having an illness. And these are just some papers to support um, the concept of anosognosia as being quite real and being a neurological deficit. Um, you also see anosognosia in things like people who have dementia or people who have a stroke. It's, a, it's an issue with the brain in terms of being able to recognize um, uh, illness. Because people who uh, have schizophrenia spectrum disorders often have a nosognosia. This is another aspect of the disease that makes it very difficult to treat um, because it's difficult to get uh, uh, consent for treatment from someone who doesn't believe that they're uh, experiencing an illness. So let's walk through a case example. Uh, meet Michael. Michael is 43 years old. He was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder at 18 and he left home soon after his diagnosis. He was increasingly distrustful of his parents and started living mostly in encampments near his home. He's frequently in the emergency department and has a history of hospitalization. He currently appears internally preoccupied. He's losing weight and sleeping through the day. He's had intermittent erratic behaviors that prompted several 5150 holds, but his stays were very brief. He's uh, being victimized. He was recently assaulted from others uh, in the encampment. He started misusing methamphetamines and he declines help from his parents and the homeless outreach team. So what are the options for Michael? He doesn't qualify for assisted outpatient treatment or AOT. He hasn't been hospitalized in the past three years. He's acted in a way that's intimidating, but not violent. He does not qualify for a 5150 hold or an LPS conservatorship. He does not qualify as gravely disabled or dangerous to himself or others. He has a sleeping bag and periodically goes to a lo local soup kitchen. He has never been suicidal and he does not threaten or express intent to hurt others. We could take a wait and see approach, but while Michael is marginally functional, he appears to be increasingly agitated, responding to internal voices, He's been assaulted a couple of times by acquaintances, and he also appears to be losing weight with less frequent visits to the soup kitchen, and he often sleeps through the day. So this is where the CARE Act 
comes in. The CARE Act can be initiated to help connect Michael with services and supports to prevent further deterioration of his illness. So this is a, a overall uh, a picture of how CARE works. There's a referral, a clinical evaluation is conducted, a care plan is developed, the patient is supported uh, following the care plan, uh, and the individual at the end uh, successfully completing the care process is on the road to recovery. There are various people who qualify as eligible petitioners to refer someone for care. Eligible petitioners include the director of a hospital or their designee, a licensed behavioral health professional or their designee, the director of a county behavioral health agency or their designee, or a first responder, including a peace officer, firefighter, paramedic, emergency medical technician, mobile crisis response worker, or homeless outreach worker who's had repeated uh, interactions with the respondent. So it's a, a wide range of uh, people who can be petitioners. Currently, we have CARE uh, uh, active in the following counties, Glen, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Diego, San Francisco, Stanislaus, and Tuolumne. Petitions may be filed uh, in, may not be filed in any of the remaining 50 counties until December 1st of this year. There are some counties that are exploring launching a little bit earlier. These links are important, and I think Aiden's going to send them out to you. Um, there's a, a link to the Judicial Council website where you can get the required petition forms and submit it to courts listed in the second link, the CARE Court Locations file. The petition, which is Form CARE 100, must be submitted along with proof of eligibility. Uh, and proof of eligibility includes either the Mental Health Declaration Form, CARE 101, or evidence that respondent was detained for at least two periods of intensive treatment, with the most recent period being within the past 60 days. After a petition is filed um, in, and reviewed, the court will determine if the respondent is or may be eligible and schedule an initial appearance within 14 days. If the court finds that the respondent is ineligible, the court may dismiss the case. Petitioners or their delegates must attend the initial hearing. In many, if not all counties, the initial hearings are happening virtually. And what we're hearing is that, that virtual uh, hearings are, are available in all counties at this time. After that initial hearing, the petitioner will be relieved and replaced. And that's the end of the petitioner's responsibility in uh, engaging that patient in care and the County Behavioral Health Director will become the substitute petitioner. The court will ensure accountability for County Behavioral Health to provide outreach, engagement, and delivery of services. Here are some links, and again, I think Aiden's gonna send, send these out to you, uh, where you can get more information on the CARE Act. You can go to the Cal HHS CARE Act website or the CARE Act Information for Petitioners site. And for more specific information on the CARE Act and other available services, the local behavioral health agency uh, can help. And there's another link here to uh, get to each county's care information uh, website. So that uh, concludes the formal portion of the presentation. And I'd be uh, delighted to uh, answer any questions that you all might have. Try to pull up the chat and see if there are questions in the Okay, so I'm starting to see some questions in the chat. Uh, how do you envision the ED interacting with the care process? Uh, thank you for that question. You know, I, I have some familiarity with uh, the work that you all do, the very noble work that you all do. 
Uh, and my understanding is that you're really uh, navigators trying to connect patients uh, to care. Uh, so I would see um, the e emergency departments having a, a large role in the care process. The same patients that cycle through my hospitals, through the county jails, um, we have data. Uh, we did some um, tracking through um, Medi-Cal utilization data and have noted that those same individuals um, spend a lot of time in your emergency departments uh, and tend to get uh, uh, their only services that they're getting right now are in emergency departments. Uh, so if you have individuals that you're working with who you're seeing frequently, um, you can go ahead and file a petition. Uh, and what that does is it moves that patient to the front of the line for services in their county. Uh, we have sort of a grim uh, uh, statement that we make that um, we're moving these individuals to the front of the line, uh, but they're not even in the line at this time, nor has anyone told them that there is a line or where the line is. Uh, so um, that's what CARE is intended to do. So you can uh, file a petition. Uh, the civil court judge will then investigate, uh, order assessments, and um, uh, help that individual uh, get connected to care. So we uh, ascertain um, or we anticipate uh, a large role for the uh, emergency departments. Uh, and the links are being sent to attendees. Um, would you consider requiring education on MAP for judges who hear petitions? Uh, what effort is being made to help them understand the benefits of MAT treatment for those with opiate use disorders? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we have done some uh, training and technical assistance, but I'm not sure that we've done anything specific to um, uh, MAT. Uh, so I'll, I'll make a note uh, to discuss that with my team and see if um, we can get some TTA recorded for them. And I see we have a volunteer, so I will take down uh, your name, Elizabeth, and uh, note that uh, <laughs> you'd be happy to provide that that training. Great. Okay. Please uh, don't be shy. I know uh, this is a complex topic. Any efforts to require MAT at psych hospitals? Um, we're, we're doing MAT at the state hospitals now, uh, so I can speak for us. Um, and we're working uh, with partners uh, in our prison system who are also um, providing MAT. I don't know about community hospitals, but we've been working really hard uh, at state hospitals. Would the petition be discussed with the pa patient prior to the petition being filed? Oh, this is a great question, and it allows me to uh, talk about a number of things. You know, in an ideal world, you have a relationship with this individual, and you can support them in, in filing their own petition uh, or um, uh, supporting them in um, um, by, by filing the petition on their behalf. So... Yes, in an ideal setting in a situation, uh, you have a, a, a therapeutic alliance with that person and you're talking about, you know, this is just an organized, accountable way to make sure that you're getting to the front of the line with these services. Um, what efforts will you be making to help the counties that defer their implementation? My understanding is staffing and bandwidth are very challenging right now. That's true. Um, we are providing um, a robust uh, TTA uh, in a variety of ways to the uh, counties. Um, uh, there's a group called HMA that's got a, a full-blown uh, training and technical assistance website, uh, and we're happy to do individualized training. We're doing um, some training with prescribers uh, uh, through my team. Uh, so there's a lot of training out there. And your comment about staffing um, and bandwidth being very challenging right now is very true. We see that 
across settings in mental health right now, the workforce effort. And so it, it, it's important to acknowledge that, and uh, but also to acknowledge that the point of care is to move individuals into care who need it the most. So yes, there, there are resource challenges, um, uh, but but the concept of this is to target the existing resources to the people who who really need it the most. At all of the LPS. Yes, you will receive a copy of the um, presentation. It went pretty fast. I apologize. I'm a fast talker, but you have a chance now to ask me any questions. Um, if I didn't uh, 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 move through the material um, slowly enough. Uh, it's still unclear to me how we can help patients as navigators in the ER uh, in regards to the CARE Act. Yes, you would file a petition. So you would file a petition for each patient uh, that you wanted to connect to services, and that would be the role. Um, if you go to the Judicial Coun Council website, um, uh, the forms are there, the instructions are there. Uh, and if there's additional technical questions, uh, we stand by uh, ready to help. But that's a good role would be to file petitions on individuals um, in the emergency department. And what will that petition do for the patient? Um, what will happen is that petition goes to a civil court. And at that point, the judge is in charge. So the judge um, takes over the process and holds everyone in the process accountable. Uh, and so the patient will be assessed. And if they meet eligibility criteria, either a care plan or a care agreement will be developed. A care plan is a court-ordered plan and a care agreement is a, an agreement where all parties agree to the three aspects of that care plan uh, without needing the court order. So the, the care plan ideally has assertive uh, community treatment level uh, wraparound services, it has a medication plan and it has a housing plan. And then the civil court, the judge, oversees the implementation of that plan to make sure that the patient is participating and to ensure that every service envisioned in that plan is being delivered to the patient in the way that it's uh, described in the plan. So that's what the petition does. Is it is it 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 um ensures accountability uh, and ensures uh, engagement by putting the, the judge in the civil court in charge of, of the implementation of that plan. Uh, how do you all discern mental health issues versus potential substance use issues? Example, meth-induced psychosis presenting as schizophrenic symptoms. Is this something healthcare providers would handle in the emergency department prior to involvement petition and care? Such a great question. And, you know, um, I work with this population too. <clears throat> and the co occurrence of both uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders and uh, methamphetamine use is, is um, very uh, uh, prevalent, and we understand this. And I think the way that I look at it as a clinician is if the individual has persisting psychotic symptoms that persist past acute intoxication, that's a schizophrenia spectrum disorder uh, at that point, and that person would qualify. So I don't think you really need to spend a lot of time sorting it out uh, if an individual presents with frank psychosis that's, that's persisting. Uh, I think it's totally appropriate to um, file the petition and let let some of the other things get sorted out in the process of the of the formal large scale assessments. Um, but but the the folks that we're targeting and the and the folks that we're seeing in state hospitals, uh, it, sometimes it's just impossible to tease out because because the um, the psychosis is is settled and complex. So it's a good question. Um, but I would not um, suggest that you need to, you know, verify completely the diagnosis if someone is presenting with hallucinations and delusions that are interfering significantly with their um, ability to function. 
The next question, my understanding is that about 50% of patients who would qualify as having extreme behavioral health disorder have their condition exacerbated by a co-occurring substance use disorder. How will patients be treated differently if they have a uh, substance use disorder? Well, I think that would be in the care plan. So um, you mentioned Matt earlier, if someone has an opiate use disorder, you know, uh, any good care plan would include services for that individual substance use disorder. And as part of the care plan, uh, there's accountability in making sure those services are going to get delivered. Um, so great question. Um, which form needs filling if our county is not listed? If your county is not listed, you have to wait until uh, December 1st. And, and the 50 counties that have did not opt to go first uh, will be implementing December 1st. Um, but that, that gives you uh, <clears throat> several months to, uh, you know, uh, think about how you can operationalize this in your setting. Is the CARE Act similar to Behavioral Health Court? You know, somewhat. Uh, you know, Behavioral Health Court is is a little further along in the process after that criminal justice involvement. And I think anybody who studies diversion knows that you want to move as far upstream as possible in the process. So, um, you know, there's multiple intercepts or points where someone who has psychotic symptoms can come into contact with the criminal justice system. Uh, and this is an attempt to, to ensure people are getting services before they have to get to the point of being arrested, um, because that, that criminal just, uh, justice involvement then confers a whole other host of challenges for that person to, to have to fight through, which is not to say that you can't um, put someone into care from jail uh, if it's clear that their that their symptoms of psychosis are what's driving their criminal justice involvement. So, uh, Tambra, yes, care is similar to behavioral health court in that you have a judge overseeing the process. You have the benefit of the black robe effect. Um, you have the accountability um, baked in, but it's just upstream. Um, if that if that helps distinguish. Who is able to file the petition? I did go through some of those slides um, and, and the petitioner, uh, the full list of petitioners on the, on the website. Uh, what safeguards are in place to assure that people are not arbitrarily engaged in this process due to an unrelated issue? I think that's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the filing of the petition does not launch any kind of process. The filing of the petition simply brings that individual to the awareness of the civil court um, care court. And at, at that point, if the judge takes a look at it and says, there's no validity here, this person um, doesn't meet the criteria, the eligibility criteria, the judge just dismisses it if there's uh, no face validity to the, to the petition. If there is potentially face validity to the petition, then the judge orders an assessment. Uh, and so in the process of that assessment, if the individual is not assessed to have a schizophrenia spectrum disorder and meet all the criteria that I, I listed out um, earlier and that will be sent to you in the slides, uh, the, the case will be um, uh, dismissed. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, due process and, and safeguards to ensure that the right people are, are getting into care. Let me know if that adequately answered uh, your question, Anna. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm concerned that filing the petitions on patients will reduce our trust between the navigator and the patient. Since so many people we see have judicial trauma. Very good point. Also, the court system has built in racial inequity and I am curious the plan to oversee these plans and make sure they are culturally competent. All really excellent uh, uh, points. Um, ideally, you have a therapeutic relationship with that patient uh, where you can explain that this is not a criminal court you're referring them to. They're not in trouble. 
uh, there are no charges. There is no um, uh, risk of, of any sort of carceral involvement and that the petition is designed to uh, prioritize them for a full-blown um, uh, mental health uh, uh, delivery of services. Uh, so if you do have that outstanding relationship with your patient, you know, the therapeutic alliance is so important. Um, and I've, I've participated working with people who have psychotic disorders and, and even if they lack insight, helping them to, uh, encouraging them to try uh, to take steps forward, you know, that's all part of that therapeutic alliance that you're forming. You know, I think that good clinical work, I guess is what I'm trying to say, can help uh, ensure that trust and build that trust and, and help that patient uh, understand that, that you're working in their best interest. Uh, and explaining that the court is not there to punish them, it's not a criminal court, the court is there to make sure uh, that the treatment gets delivered uh, and, and in the way that the patient needs. I think that type of work can um, go a long way. Uh, we did do, um, you know, it's no secret that uh, the court system has built in racial inequity, and there are also disparities in terms of mental health systems and the diagnoses of schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Um, there's been historical discrepancies in the types of medications that get prescribed. Um, and so we, in the care space, have informed ourselves with that literature and engaged uh, an equity um, advisor. Um, uh, she came in and spoke to our stakeholder group. That that talk is on the CARE uh, HHS website. Uh, and, and also both of the research um, evaluators, uh, health management associations, and RAND are building in uh, data collection systems to make sure uh, that that the uh, care that's being delivered is culturally competent and that the care process overall uh, is not perpetuating uh, inequity. So these are all very good questions. There's been a lot of um, rigorous discussion about, you know, this is care court. And uh, I've, I've heard the opinion that it should be called care court from uh, peers stating anything else is somewhat disingenuous. I think uh, others are calling it the CARE Act because it's really about connecting people to care uh, and using the court as a, a lever to make sure people get connected to care. So these are all great points that you're making and, it, and it's part of the discussion right now uh, in terms of mental health reform at large. And, uh, what we're doing now isn't working. This is a, a careful attempt to thread the needle uh, and build in some accountability on treatment delivery uh, without being overly uh, coercive. And I think a lot of that is going to depend on the implementation and, and safeguarding those therapeutic uh, relationships. So I, I appreciate, Elizabeth, you bringing up those points, and I hope I address them adequately. We would really like your help. Sorry, sometimes when someone puts a new question, the question goes around. We would really like your help to get more info about Matt to these stakeholders. Absolutely, will do. And there's John ensuring that. So we, I, you will hear from us uh, around getting that Matt training. Um, some referrers have to be hospital director, licensed mental health provider, a designated. I have, I got kicked off and let back in and I'll just keep going. Uh, since referees have to be uh, hospital director, licensed mental health provider, designees, can sons follow, file a petition? Yes, you could be considered a designee. And for those of you um, on the call or in counties where uh, care has not been implemented yet, this would be a great time to uh, have discussions 
uh, with your stakeholder groups to figure out uh, a, an efficient uh, system uh, for referrals uh, where you are. And, and we're happy to provide individual um, technical assistance at any time, uh, work individually with your group, whatever it, it takes to help um, get a process going so you can uh, start doing uh, referrals. If there are any other questions, please uh, let me know. I'd be happy to answer them. I hope I'm still here. <laughs> I went away for a minute, but... Uh... Still here. Thank you, Chum. If, if you ask me a question and I didn't completely answer it, or you want to have more of a dialogue, please just... Uh... Let me know. These are really, really great questions you're asking. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. Uh, I don't know if you are Aiden. Nope. I see one new question in the chat. Yes, I just, given the shortage of beds and resources, especially in rural communities, what support are courts able to provide patients to navigate those issues? I mean, this is a this is a, a great question. And, you know, it's also a good time to mention that this administration, um, you know, I've been working in this space for over 20 years and uh, the the individuals that I'm talking about, the individuals that I work with are are very often, as I mentioned, not at the back of the line. They're not even in the line. They don't know there's a line. No one's trying to find them to get them into line for services. And this administration, it's been a real um, incredible six years for somebody like me who's been watching this happen for a long time. Care is one component of sort of a, a massive mental health reform in California that includes Prop 1, um, and also a significant amount of funding in, in the billions and billions of dollars uh, for housing supports and mental health infrastructure. So yes, it's true. We have we don't have a mental health continuum, a robust mental health continuum right now. Uh, and we have a workforce shortage right now. And so my perspective is right now, what the judges will be able to do is to prioritize these patients for care, you know, engage the the people who have the resources to make sure that these pa patients are being prioritized for the resources in the short term. And in the long term, uh, there is so much money and, and um, uh, incentive now between Prop 1 and some of these other housing and infrastructure um, uh, efforts, you know, in five years, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be an issue anymore, um, given the, given the level of resources that be, are being expended. So it's not to, to not acknowledge the lack of resources. And I would argue that the lack of resources and the lack of prioritization of these individuals for resources are driving a lot of really bad situations in California, including the fact that our state hospitals are, are being overwhelmed with people who've been arrested on felonies, uh, who are unsheltered and untreated uh, and getting arrested because they're uh, psychotic and unsheltered. So um, what CARE is intended to do is move those people to the front of the line because they're the ones really suffering the worst outcomes. Um, and, the, and the court's going to be able to do that because the court's going to be able to call in um, whoever necessary to make sure that, uh, that 
this, these most vulnerable people are, are being prioritized for the um, resources that do exist. I'll just tell you, since there's no other questions, but this question has has um, brought it to mind. Uh, just what we see in the state hospital system, as well as um, uh, people who then go into the prison system, is the um, individuals who have schizophrenia spectrum disorders who are getting arrested on felony charges have increased 10 to 20 percent a year every year for the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, the the folks that come in uh, are having more and more criminal justice contact uh, before they come in on that felony uh, uh, charge. Um, we've studied this group of individuals uh, extensively uh, and two thirds of the people who are coming into us after that felony arrest, you know, the vast majority have a schizophrenia spectrum disorder and two thirds of them are homeless at the time that they're arrested. Uh, with fully half of them being completely unsheltered with no access to electricity or water at the time that they're arrested. Half of the people coming into us haven't received any mental health um, uh, uh, services in the six months prior to their arrest, like no mental health services in the six months prior to their arrest. And those that do uh, receive mental health services are largely seen, no surprise to you all, in emergency departments, uh, not in any kind of co comprehensive care. And when we, we studied the arrest reports for these individuals, what we're finding is they're getting arrested because they're unsheltered and untreated and, and behaving in a way in, in public because they don't have a home that makes people uncomfortable and um, uh, getting booked into jail because there's, there's no other place uh, to take them. And so care is one uh, aspect of a larger strategy on the part of the administration to disrupt that uh, cycle. Uh, and and that's why, you know, I'm not trying to be callous by saying we move them to the front of the line, but that's really why we're trying to implement care as a as a lever to to prioritize these individuals who need it the most uh, for care. Uh, who is the portrait in your background? That's just a little psychiatric humor. That's uh, uh, Sigmund Freud. And I was at a flea market and um, I said, oh, that's Sigmund Freud. And the man said, oh, I'll give it to you for 15 bucks if you're a psychiatrist. And just happened that I was. So I that was a long time ago back in my training day. So I just keep it up there to remind myself. I, I can't see you or hear you, but I, I have really enjoyed interacting with you. Uh, some of the most sophisticated and thoughtful uh, questions um, that I've seen. I wish I wish we could interact in a little bit more human form, but I, I really, really appreciate what you all do. It's critically important, um, your heroes. Uh, and if you can help us help these folks and prevent them from the conditions that they're currently in, uh, you know, be very, very grateful and, and very happy to have you on the team. And we will get in touch about the mat training. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's, that's, um, thank, and thank you. I'm, I'm getting thank yous in the chat. Thank you so much. I want to, I want to offer to come back. Uh, if you all want to think about this a little bit and, and have more questions, I'd be happy to come back. Uh, if your particular site wants some individualized TA, we'd be happy to provide it. Um, 
And all the material, my slides, and and all the links that we referenced uh, should be coming out from from Aiden. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Warburton, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for joining our webinar today. All resources, including the slides, the links, will all be included in a post-event email shortly after. And for future trainings, I will drop the link to our webpage. And you can check out our future trainings on our website. And I look forward to seeing you there. That being said, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And thank you all for joining us.